get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling Hello BYWG Tribe, this is Dr. Noah. We wanted to make you aware of our carefully selected product of the month and book of the month for January 2018. Keep in mind all the links and discount codes for the book and products will be listed in the show notes in iTunes and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. Our book of the month is Beyond the Mat. Achieve Focus, Presence, and Enlightened Leadership Through the Principles and Practice of Yoga by Julie Rosenberg, MD. Our product of the month is Swanies, our favorite and most stylish blue light blocking glasses for better sleep. Both Julie Rosenberg, discussing her book, and James Swanwick, discussing better sleep, can be heard on the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast archives. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I am your co-host. Today our guest is actor, producer, entrepreneur, David Bianchi. I first heard David on one of the podcasts I recommend and that's Sean Croxton's quote of the day. Thank you, David, for being on and agreeing to be on today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, let me let me do your bio because it's it's uh, it's it's pretty diverse and pretty unbelievable and then we'll get started uh from rochester new york now based in hollywood california he first hit the stage in third grade in in mexico city he is classically trained with a bfa in theater film from arizona state university david is brazilian italian and fluent in english spanish and portuguese with over 90 imdb credits from studio and independent films he can be seen in major films and indies like Elizabethtown, Priest, Philly Brown, as well as numerous TV appearances on hit shows like HBO's Westworld, Pretty Little Liars, The Last Ship, Southland, General Hospital, and Days of Our Lives. His work in front of the camera has earned him membership into the very prestigious Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. David is also a globally known spoken word poet with TV appearances on two seasons of the NAACP award-nominated show Verses and Flow. David produces spoken word films, most recently alongside Emmy-nominated, Grammy award-winning actor and poet Malcolm Jamal Warner. Whew! David is a modern-day Renaissance man that truly believes in the power of art and the importance of his craft. David has 18 IMDb producer credits, 16 screenwriting credits, and is the founder of Exertion Films. Man, that's one heck of a bio, David. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you for, for saying that and, and, and speaking it with such gravitas. You make me actually sound like a serious guy. Ooh, ooh. Well, listen, like I said, and I want to just repeat, you know, I, I heard you um, do a little bit of a quote or a little bit of your spoken word on a podcast that I highly recommend, Sean Croxon's Quote of the Day. Uh, I put it up on Instagram. You you know, you reached out to me, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, – that you you pay attention to your Instagram, and I'm thankful you for being on that quote of the week, and uh, uh, thankful for you being on today. Well, I, I do appreciate that, and you know, big shout out to to, to Sean Croxton and what he does. He inspires millions of people, and also a big shout out to um, uh, Kelly Kristen, who is a. Uh, he was also a, a, a life coach as well, who turned me on to Sean Croxton, who was familiar with my work. So, you know. Everything that's good in my life has been a direct result of helping somebody else. And me speaking with you right now uh, is a direct result of people helping me. And so I think that reciprocity is really the foundation of, of one of the foundations of success. So um, I'm not surprised that we are speaking. So thank you for taking the time. No, oh, my pleasure. Now, how about personalizing your bio just a little bit for our audience? Uh, personalizing it, I, I'm not as- so you're sure how to personalize it. I mean, uh, to, to make a long story short, I'm an artist. Um, I, I see the world through art, and uh, I came to Los Angeles about 13 and a half years ago um, with, you know, with dreams of pursuing a career as a, and, and becoming a working actor, um, and uh, you know, and, and facing the pitfalls of what Hollywood has to offer. Through that process, um, I took my career, you know, in my own hands and began. Pre- Producing content as a result of Hollywood not affording me the opportunities that I believe I was owed. 
<laughs> you know, self entitlement with every artist. And so, but 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 through that desperation, through receiving the gift of desperation, I realized that producing was something that I can do and something that over the course of many years I became quite good at. And so as a direct result of wanting to act, I began to produce things that I act in. And then that quickly turned into building a, rep a reputation around Hollywood of a very serious actor, but also a very serious producer as well. Um, and then the, the spoken word stuff is, you know, writing has always been a passion of mine, um, hence being now uh, in the closing phases of my new manuscript and my new book called Pursue, Reach, Attain, Retain, Repeat. Um, I do believe that I'm a Renaissance guy. I, I, I love art for the sake of art. Uh, but my, my primary focus in, in Hollywood is, is as an actor and as a filmmaker. Cool. Now, we're definitely going to get into your new book for sure. But, uh, you know, when I heard you speak, when I hear you speak now, it, it seems your energy and your passion is boundless. Uh, do you have do you have secrets to that boundless energy and boundless passion? <laughs> you know, um, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, I'm a pretty electric guy. Uh, I don't know if it's by DNA. I'm Italian or Brazilian. So, I mean, maybe it's part of this my DNA. Um, but, uh, you know, look, I, I think that it really boils down to purpose. Um, one has to find one's purpose. Um, and I, and, and I discuss this in my writing about finding what your molecular level gift is. Uh, I believe that everybody has a molecular level gift, um, that is designed, that is written all the way down to a molecular level that they need to give on to the world. And, and, and it is sometimes we discover it very early on in our lives. Sometimes we discover it later on in our lives. Um, in, in terms of the motivation, I think it is about also dissecting down what is purpose. Because we have long-term purpose, you know, our, our, our wildest dreams. And then we have sort of, you know, mid-long-term purpose. But then we have to have interim purpose. What are the daily things that are going to get us out of bed every day that are going to charge us, that are going to give us that daily lightning bolt while we fight for the long-term purpose? And that interim purpose for me is having great conversations with you, um, you know, working, you know, prepping for a film that I'm going to be shooting in Colorado this weekend. Um, you know, doing the sort of the ins and outs of my day to day life while I am in active pursuit of my long term purpose. And what is your long term purpose? Uh, to earn an Academy Award and leave an artistic legacy. Uh, I love the fact that you knew it r without hesitation. That's really important. Yeah, and it, it is without hesitation. And, and I think that. And, and I think that, you know, the idea of earning an Academy Award um, is, you know, yes, yeah, the brass ring. Um, but that is the pinnacle of my industry. But more importantly, I want to leave an artistic legacy um, because there's nothing here of, of this earthly world I can take with me. But I'm very interested in leaving things behind me because my ancestors worked so hard uh, to be able to create opportunities for themselves. And I would be shirking myself and my ancestors if I didn't follow suit. So leaving a legacy to inspire people when I'm long gone, I think is the most important thing. Um, and the Academy Award is, 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 is obviously one of the things that we fight for the most as actors. David, what, what are some traits, you know, working as an actor, working as a producer, do you see essential for someone inspiring to walk uh, in your footsteps? I think that um, regardless of what your discipline is, I believe that everybody has to have a certain amount of instinctual capacity for whatever it is that they do. Um, as an actor, you could learn, you know, uh, the American dramatic canon, um, Stanislavski, Stella Adler techniques, you can learn Meisner techniques, you can, you know, learn voice and diction techniques, but eventually you have to sway an audience into believing that you have recreated that text through your physical form and created catharsis through what you do with your physical form. So at some point you have to have instincts for it. You know, say for example, if you're if you're a prosecuting attorney, you can learn the bar until you're blue in the face, you eventually have to sway a jury of your peers. Uh, so I think you have to have that. Now once you believe that you have have those instincts, then I think there's a couple other things. It really is diligence. Um, it is a constant state of acceptance for things outside of you that you cannot control. And I also believe we have to be in touch with some sort of spiritual component that centers us. Now, that isn't necessarily religiously. 
I think that it is something that is rooted in the inner voice. We need to be able to intuitively be able to constantly listen to our inner voice, to have some sort of compass to guide us uh, when things get tough. Um, there are many actors and artists alike that are not as talented as others, but are diligent and are workhorses and will not stop showing up. And I have seen artists who are incredibly talented, but unfortunately lack that that belief in that inner voice in themselves that gives them the gumption to get out of bed every day and they end up squandering their gift because they don't have what the other individual has, which is the, 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 the never ending thirstless desire to compete. And I think that that is essential, uh, regardless of whatever your, your, your respective discipline is. Is it a competition in your business? You know, um, I think that yes and no. Um, certainly, you know, look, when we talk about awards, yeah, it's a competition. But, I mean, it's, it's all art, so art is subjective. So it's all opinion-based. Um, I personally believe that there is more than enough to go around. Um, but you do have to have a certain amount of competitive mentality to function at a high level in, this, in my particular field, and I think in any particular field, whether you aspire to become a director of marketing or whether, you know, you aspire to, to, to take whatever financial grant you were afforded in your, in your medical practice to, 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 to find that breakthrough in, in whatever your discipline is. Uh, I think you have to have a competitive edge. Um, treating everything like a competition, I think, closes the door on growth. Because none of us are islands and none of us are rocks. We can't do this alone. Anybody that believes we can get to that pinnacle of success alone, I think is, I think is foolish. So as soon as I, I look at everything as a competition, I'm closing the doors on the ability to open up my arms to other people, to link arms with people, to be able to get to the next step of what my, of what my respective legend is going to become. Um, so having an edge to know that I have to move forward and I have to be diligent, I have to drop my shoulder every once in a while, sure. But looking at everything as a competition, I think is a shortcut. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. Now, who, who do you emulate in, in both your, the acting world and the producer world? Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. Um, I think emulation is a, is a tricky word, um, especially when it comes to art. Um, all, all art is stolen. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, you know, we're always reinventing the wheel, per se. Um, but I do have people that I admire. Um, great people like Morgan Freeman, great people like Denzel Washington. Uh, I really have a deep admiration for Will Smith. I mean, Will is one of the, you know, he says it publicly very often. He's like, I may not be the best actor, but you will not outwork me, right. you know. Um, and, and those are those are I look for specific qualities in, in individuals that really, really speak to me. Um, you know, I as far as as far as as, as producers, um, you know, there there are mega producers. Uh, there are film directors that I think I look up to a little bit more than producers, directors like Darren Aronofsky. Um, you know, directors like the, the you know, God rest his soul, Tony Scott, Ridley Scott. Um um, Antoine Fuqua, who I just had the, the privilege of, of acting in one of his most recent films that's now in production. Um, you know, really, really smart artists with, with, with high aesthetics are really what I look for because those are the things that I aspire to. Um, in the world of art, all we really have is our name and our reputation. Um, people will inevitably forget what you shot. They will forget what you've created. Uh, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And they will never forget how hard you work. Right. Um, and I think that having a high aesthetic and um, not necessarily taking yourself so seriously in your personal life, but taking yourself very seriously in your professional life um, is also part of the bedrock to 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 long term success. Yeah, I, I love what you said, you know, and we say this, too, in my profession, uh, health, chiropractic, that, uh, you know, people won't remember what you say, but they'll remember how you make them feel. Absolutely. And I think that my I think Maya Angelou was was quoted as saying that um, widely. And I absolutely agree with it. I was just recently on a on a personal sabbatical around Europe. And one of the things that that, that was really drawn to my attention is that as Americans, we spend more time investing in the material than we do in the experiential. 
And that's one of the things that I'm trying to actively spend more time doing, which is really investing in the experiential, not just for people around me and in my personal circle, but investing in the experiential for myself. To because memories exist in, in, in connectivity and in the fabric of the human condition. It's easy for me to buy something for somebody to walk away, but it's hard for me to do something for someone or with someone. To create a, a long-lasting bond between people that will be the fabric that will hold you together and maybe at some point be the leverage that you need if you end up in a tight situation. Yep, well said, well said. Now, I have one kind of jovial question that I need to ask before we start talking a little bit more about about your new book and your man, and your manuscript. And uh, after, when I was prepping for an interview, I saw that you were on Days of Our Lives. Now, uh, I, was, uh, I was once upon a time on Days of Our Lives. Indeed. Right. So for those loyal BYD, BYWG listeners, they would remember that you're the second interviewee that I had – that had acted on my mother and my favorite daytime soap opera. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, first, the first being Annie Nilo from Alatura. I don't know if you're familiar with Andy. I, I don't. I'm not familiar with Andy, but I can quickly look him up. Yeah, a Andy uh, was is, is was an actor slash model, and he um created this uh, product of uh, like facial care and body care products called Alatura. But he was on Days of Our Lives as well. So I have to ask. Yeah, he was he was he's billed as the hot guy on Days of Our Lives. Look him up now. <laughs> and uh, so I have to ask: Do you do you remember what part you played, what year, and who you acted with? <laughs> um. Yes, I do. Um. It was about 2015 or so. So it wasn't that long ago. And uh, who was I in the scene with? Um. I played a construction worker. It was sort of a one-day job. Um, and, um, you know, it was like a demolition sequence. Um, and let me see if I can remember who I was in the scene with. I think I was I was with maybe, um, oh, God, it's been so long. Um, and, and for anybody that's out there, this is Days of Our Lives fan, they're probably, you know, <laughs> sort of slapping themselves in their chair and wondering why I didn't take it so soon. Not taking it so seriously, but as an actor, you do so much work. Oftentimes, you know, you forget who you work with. Um, sure, sure. Uh, but uh, Trevor Donovan might have been Trevor Donovan. Um, that could have been him. Um, but let me get back to uh, let me get back to you on that. But uh, Days of Our Lives is a fantastic. Days of Our Lives is a fantastic show. I have nothing but great things to say about the show because it really is a stepping stone for so many great actors. I mean, even you know George. Clooney, I mean, Brad Pitt, I mean, these guys started, you know, they got their, their, their chops wet in soaps. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it's a show that has such an incredible legacy, you know. And just and for people out there that don't understand how soaps work, they shoot really, really fast. So, to give you a sense of how that's done, you know, you show up, you know, you know what you're going to do, you got your lines, but you get on set and it's one take, two takes, move on. One take, two takes, move on. So, they're always looking for a certain kind of, you know, sort of grease actor because you don't, there's no room for error in that show. Um, and for the series regulars on that show, you know, their lives are really intense. You know, they're in front of the camera doing one take, one take for 12 hours a day. They turn around and go home and then they got 30 pages of lines they got to learn and they wake up and do it all over again. <laughs> that, so that's neat. That's neat. Uh, yeah, everybody thinks that that's like a cake job or that's easy, but that's, that's a nice insight into, you know, how difficult that job could actually be. Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of people look at it and say, oh, it's melodrama, but, you know, you know, if you're a series regular on a show like that, you're shooting 30, 40 pages of dialogue a day, you know, and that's intense. That's really, really intense, especially when you only get one or two takes because they're moving so quickly. So, I mean, there's greatness in there, too, because there's a tremendous amount of focus, uh, discipline um, that needs to come with not just the professional world, but also the private world. You know, there's no going out. You know, there's no hitting the town and, and being quote-unquote glamorous when you're in production. It is all on, hands on deck, full-on focus. Because if you fail, the camera doesn't lie. Right, right. That's a really great insight. Th thank you for indulging me on that question. Sure, sure. So, so let's round out your Renaissance man tendencies. You're writing a book called uh, Pursue, Reach, Attain, Retain, and Repeat. How about yeah. breaking down each one of those uh, – 
those statements a little bit for our audience to give us a little bit of a feel of what to expect when it does come out. Sure, sure thing, and, and thank you for asking. Um, yeah, pra, yeah, pra, pra, I call it pra, PR, Pursue Regions Hair and Therapy, pra, like a lion roaring. You know, it, a lot of it sort of comes from the idea of it being a spin cycle, that success and failure is absolutely cyclical. You can't have one without the other. And as we begin sort of our careers and our journeys into what is going to be the attainment of pursuing our molecular level gift, um, we fail much, much more than we succeed. And slowly, that circle begins to turn and we have fewer failures and more and more successes. And the distance between failure and success becomes more and more broad. It starts with the idea of pursuit. Because the idea of pursuit in my mind, is that pursuing takes an active decision, which creates the instigation for an activity. You know, we can have a philosophical conversation and maybe say something like, okay, if there are three men sitting on, on a diving board, one of them decides to jump, how many men are left on the diving board? I don't know. Arguably, some people could say two. Some people might argue three. I would argue potentially three. Because just because we make decisions doesn't mean we act or move into the center of that decision. Because people make decisions every day but don't always act. So even just the idea of pursuing something is an activity that has to happen in the mind and identifying what it is that you're going to pursue before you get there. And then the idea of reaching. Reaching going into a and the action of reaching, because just because we're in pursuit of something doesn't necessarily mean that when we get there, we have the courage uh, the wherewithal, um, the environment to reach for whatever it is that we're reaching for. Oftentimes, people make decisions to pursue things and flounder at the last minute. How many people have been left abandoned at the altar? So that's an example. I mean, that's a very dramatic example. But even the idea of reaching is, again, it's the constant idea of the moving forward and the thought process of reaching into something that you have been actively pursuing, being honest with yourself and not giving yourself concessions. Now, once you attain something, you get to the step of making the conscious decision to reach. Now, I have attained. Now, once I've attained something, right, the success in achieving, something that you desire that you've worked for. So at that point, we believe that, okay, I've attained this thing. I've attained this milestone, this goal. Say, for example, with me, it might be publishing of the book. Okay, I've attained it. Now you feel like you can step back. In fact, that is absolutely what you should not be doing. Because once we attain something, that is when we have to push it into fifth gear and work harder. You know, because this is where the rubber hits the road. And we have to remove ourselves from the equation completely. Because attaining something is only the beginning of what is going to be the long-term journey to the next level of your success. You know, because then you have to figure out how to retain. One of the examples I use in the book is a surfer. You know, you go through the process of getting the perfect wave. You're out there, you're paddling, you're pursuing the perfect wave, you're catching, you know, you're catching a little undertow and you're out there and you're waiting. Finally, you catch that perfect wave. You paddle just so perfectly with your arms so you can catch the flow of the water. You pop up on your feet and now you've got the perfect wave. Out on the sand, you've got onlookers that are supporting you and watching you and cheering you on. Now, you have attained that perfect wave. In other words, you have attained the pinnacle of where you think you're supposed to be. Now, you have two choices when you're riding that perfect wave. You can look to the sand and you can have eye contact and sort of showboat and, 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 soak the, and, and, and sort of soak into the, the glory and bask in the glory of the fact that you've attained this moment. Or you can keep your head down and think about how you're going to retain what you have attained. Because if you spend too much time looking at the sand, that wave's going to break under your feet. And guess what? The next surf is coming up behind you, and those people on the sand have forgotten about you because they're watching the next surfer. Or you can be focused on the next step of your process, which is getting out of attaining and retaining what you've attained so that you can then turn around and have the discipline to repeat. And it changes for everyone. And everybody has a different sort of Everybody has a different line of work. Everybody has a different set of goals that they want to achieve. And so it's slightly different for everyone. But in a loose way of breaking it down, that's sort of what I'm trying to show people is that we have to understand that 
most of our circumstances are beyond our human control, but our conduct is in our own power. And how do we conduct ourselves when we are actively pursuing, reaching, attaining, retaining, and trying to repeat in order so that we can create an ongoing cycle of success with bigger distances between our failures? So we can take that first cycle, put it in a box and make it passive income, and reinvent yourself into the next step of your pursue, reach, attain, retain, repeat cycle, and continue to do this throughout the rest of your life. Hope that makes sense. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. When when do you foresee this book coming out? I look to be I look to be published by uh, end of the first quarter. So it's right around the corner. Uh, I am very, very deep in the in, 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 in my manuscript. I'm going through some deep revisions. I have some great colleagues that are New York Times bestsellers that are pretty interested in what I'm doing. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that it will be published and it will be published very soon. And I look forward to, uh, to doing a speaking tour that will be sort of revolving around the book. I mean, one of the things that I do want to do and I aspire to do is just to remind people that everything that they need to be successful is already in their own backyard. <laughs> but we get so busy trying to focus on what is in front of us and slightly in our periphery that we forget that we are the owners of our own power. Our deepest, our deepest ability to be successful is inside of our diaphragms, our hearts, and our spirits, and our minds. We already own all of this. And I want to remind people that everything that you need is already within you. And if you can begin to lead by example, people will follow. That's great. Now, you, you talked about a speaking tour. You, you do quite a bit of spoken word, too. Uh, how, how did that happen? Mm, I do. Um, back in New York, uh, growing up in the early days, sort of like what we consider the golden age of hip-hop, which is like 95, 90 to 95, um, I was a battle rap. And I used to do a lot of freestyle in the streets and whatnot. And so that eventually evolved as I got into higher learning. Um, that Then I found uh, this idea of like slam poetry, spoken word poetry. I was like, oh, what is this? Oh, I can, I can be sophisticated and I, don't, and I can be a linguist, but I don't have to be a thug. Oh, that appeals to me. <laughs> because in the 90s, it's like if you weren't a thug, then you, know, you weren't a rapper. And so I didn't, that, didn't really, that really didn't really compute or speak to my person. So I ended up finding the, the, the slam poetry scene uh, moving to Arizona when I was at Arizona State. And then that sort of blossomed into producing uh, slam poetry events. And then now that sort of evolved into me doing, you know, a lot of spoken word. And now I produce spoken word films. So I have amassed a massive library of spoken word films, which are essentially – um, experimental narratives told entirely in poetry. And so when I do leadership speaking, I like to incorporate elements of spoken word poetry in my speaking performances. Um, I think that it adds a, a different layer um, to, to my message. I think it adds a different layer to the audience's experience. Um, and it's interactive. It's fun. You know, and it makes it more than just a sort of, you know, a cookie cutter jar talk. It really makes it uh, an experience. Uh, wow, you you truly are a Renaissance man. Uh, uh, is there anything you don't do? <laughs> do you do you cook? Uh, you know what? I love to cook. I I really really love to cook. I I was just you know when I was just frolicking around Europe, and I I say this all the time. I always look for the love in food. You know, if I can't taste the love in it, I don't want it. And even when I look at food, I look at it as art. You know, because. Uh, some chef, some sous chef, you know, cut his teeth for 20 years to be able to be in a position where he can put that plate of food on your, uh, in front of you. And uh, I think that there's gravitas in that, you know. So I, I think there's art in everything. Totally, totally agree. Now I have a, a, just a last few questions. One of them is a question I ask everybody. Uh, near the end and what, the day in the life of David, you know, when you wake up to when you go to bed, what's your daily rhythm or rituals? Um, I mean, that for, for me being an, a, as an actor, I'm an independent contractor and as a filmmaker, I'm an independent contractor. So that changes on a daily day basis. But there are, a, there, there are a couple of things that I do every day without film, no matter what. As soon as I wake up, I work really hard before I even look at my cell phone to stop and I get on my knees 
and I talk to, to God, or who I perceive God to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody has a different conception of, of what God is. It could be a higher power. Uh, I'm not here to talk about religion, just about what works for me. And I ask my God to give me uh, the power of clarity. I ask for humility. I ask for focus. I ask for diligence. I ask for calm. I ask for reservation of, of, of hand, body, and tongue, text message, tweet. Uh, I ask for empathy. I ask for humility. I ask for love. Um, for me, it's a, it's sometimes it's five minutes. Sometimes it's two minutes. Sometimes it's even been 10 minutes. You know, I'll speak to my God and I'll have a, a quiet moment. I'll try to meditate and just listen to the environment for five or six minutes. It's, for me, a great way to step outside of my ego and my perceived wants and needs and desires and step into my conscious contact with the spiritual world around me so that I can put myself in a position to be available and be of service to people. Um, it centers me. It aligns me. Uh, because Hollywood is a chaotic place. Um, and there's, there's a lot out there that will derail you uh, if you let it. Um, Another thing that I do is I always make sure that I call at least one person or two people that I'm mentoring, and I make sure that I call one of my mentors. Those are things that I do every day without fail. Um, I think that it is important to have people that you mentor to put yourself in a position of humility and a position of service, and also uh, talk to someone who is your mentor uh, so that you can be in a position of perpetual inspiration. Um, even if it is just checking in and leaving a voicemail, just knowing that I'm in contact with that person that moves me and inspires me um, is very important to me on a daily basis. So those are two, those are a few things that I do every day no matter what. I try to journal as well. Any exercise routines, uh, later, later night routines to kind of calm your body down, anything like that? Sure. And, I mean, physical fitness for me is, is like religion. I mean, that's like religion. I'm, I'm in the gym, you know, four or five days a week, and it typically um, comprises mostly of, of core work, um, body, body mass work, um, lots of sit-ups. I do 100 sit-ups and 100 push-ups a day. Um, I think that most people, if you could do that, you'll, you'll pretty much remain healthy. Um, I eat a very clean diet. I do drink a lot of coffee, uh, but uh, that's probably my only vice. I don't drink alcohol. I don't, you know, no, no, nothing like that. I don't, I don't smoke cigarettes. So, um, as far as at night, uh, at night I sort of do a little bit of the same. I get a little lazy at night, I will admit. But at night, whenever I lay my head on the pillow. Um, I always talk to that inner voice and I say, thank you. I say, thank you for today. Thank you for another day. Thank you for my health. And I try to do a, 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 even if it's just a mental checklist, a review of the day, you know, was I, was I kind to people? Was I unfair to people? Um, did I do the best that I could? Is there a reason for me to maybe pick up the phone the next day and, Maybe say to somebody, hey, you know what? I went a little hard on you. I apologize. Is there a place where I need to sort of make up for maybe where I fell short? Um, it's a good way of holding myself accountable. And it also brings me to a place of peace at night. And then I've got a, also a daily reflections book that I read every day as well. I, I tend to read my daily reflections in the morning. Uh, and then um, I also have a nightly reflections book that I, I often take a look at in bed as well right before I go to sleep. Seems like a lot of gratitude from to me. You know, I, you know, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. There's no other way to put it. Because uh, look, I am blessed with the opportunity to work in a business that people dream to participate in, and none of this is guaranteed. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you own, you know, 500 acres and you're a farmer. You better be grateful for the rain. You know. Um, you know, if you're a guy, a blue collar guy, you know, be grateful for your union. I mean, everybody has something to be grateful for. Be grateful for the soles on the shoes that you're, that you're walking around in. Be, be grateful for your health. Be grateful for the people that love you. I write gratitude lists on a regular basis because it's so easy to get caught up in the things that I think I should have as opposed to reminding myself of the glorious things that I do have. You know, if I'm in a place of gratitude, you really, you can't punch the smile off my face. 
I might get upset and ask why you did, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but uh, you know, but it's it's uh, being in a place of gratitude is infectious. It's infectious to people around you, um, and when you're not in that place of gratitude, your circle will call you on it. They will say, "What is wrong with you? What's going on?" And they'll pull you aside and they'll want to talk because they will know that something is off. They absolutely, absolutely will. Now. How, what's the best way for our audience to keep up to date on what you're doing? Because it's a heck of a lot of things. Sure, um, and, I, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, you can, I'm very easily, you can Google me, David Bianchi, B-I-A-N-C-H-I. Um, I'm very active on Instagram uh, in my personal life, and that's uh, D Bianchi. D Bianchi SAG, so D Bianchi S as in Sam, A as in Apple, G as in Gary, so Screen Actors Guild. So D Bianchi SAG, that's my personal Instagram. Uh, but David Bianchi is my is my personal website. And other than that, you can Google me and you can find me on Facebook. Um, I'm always putting out messages of of positivity and messages of inspiration um, for anybody that follows me. I'm always interested in engaging with people. Obviously, you and I, we connected on Instagram. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I'm not afraid of that. I, I, I love connecting with people. I love hearing how people's lives are changing. And I love hearing how I can be better. So I, I take feedback. I take criticism. You know, I, I live in a world full of criticism, so I got tough skin, you know. What, uh, what what movies or programs can we see you in soon? Anything coming out? Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, there's a new film called Destined uh, uh, that uh, just had a limited uh, release in theaters that will release digitally. That will probably release uh, Hulu and Netflix um, in January, which is right around the corner. Uh, you'll be able to catch me on season two of, of HBO's Westworld. Um, and that's going to be coming around in 2018, um, as well as a new show called Unsolved, uh, which is going to be on USA. And that's uh, going to start airing in the first quarter of 2018. Um, and that's a great show. That's uh, Unsolved, The Murders of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls. Oh, all right. Okay. So that's going to be on, that's going to be on USA. Um, those are the immediate ones. Um there's a great film, uh, that, or you can go on Hulu, and there's a film, great film that I play a pretty good leading role in called All Out Dysfunction, which is a dark comedy. FYI, it's not for the kids. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good one. That one, I, I wrote that, and I produced that, and also played one of the leads in that one as well. And that's on Hulu, Amazon Prime, uh, Apple TV. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, you can catch that one, too. Awesome. Any last words for our audience, David? Um... You know, one of the things that I, I, I write a lot of quotes, and one of the quotes that I'm pretty happy about that stuck with me over the years is, the only time not worth taking time is time wasted. And um, it's an interesting play against itself, you know, in that you never know if time is wasted unless it took time to begin with. But if you're in a position in your life where you are vibrating on a frequency that emotes positivity, there is not a moment in your life that will be wasted. So always take the time. Thank you, David. I appreciate your time. And I appreciate yours. I'm happy that we spoke, and thanks for having me. My pleasure. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you'd like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and family and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. You can sign up for our credible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. <laughs>